Hi, I'm Lisa Goldberg, and welcome to the Right Mind, Right Weight Summit. I'm here today with a very special guest, Greg McBride, who is a screenwriter, blogger, and author. And Greg has an amazing story to tell us today. Greg, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's so good to have you here. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, I was just so fascinated by your story. So please tell us a little bit about you, what you do, and what led you to create Just Stop Eating So Much. Well, uh, I live here in Los Angeles, and as you said, I'm a, a screenwriter, an author, and a blogger. And one of my passions is writing about health and nutrition and mindful eating and just getting more back in touch with what can make us healthy and a whole person. And the reason for that is when I was six years old, I started gaining weight. And uh, that might not sound so so different from other people's journeys, but I actually ended up weighing over 450 pounds by the time I graduated from college. And I have a picture here. Wow. It's on my blog, but I always love to show this picture. There are my man boobs, Lisa. And then the other thing I love to show, you can't really see it, but that I had a perm. <laughs> so I was trying to do what I could to look right. good at the time. But, so um, you, were, you were in your early 20s there. I was in my early 20s, and I'd been overweight my whole life, so I'd experienced, you know, all sorts of self-hatred and prejudice and all that kind of stuff and kept trying to diet. In fact, when I was in first grade, my parents tried to put me on diets, and I would get, you know, these badly Xerox copies of diets, and it was like the uh -huh. old school hamburger patty and cottage cheese. Right. And, you know, looking back now, and thanks to people like you, we know that's probably one of the worst things you can do, especially for a child, you know, to teach them this on-off. But that's what I did was I learned this on-off mentality. And in fact, for me, um, I started to rebel against my parents by cheating. It wasn't alcohol. It wasn't drugs. It wasn't smoking. It was always junk food because it was basically forbidden from our household. So uh -huh. it got to a point where I would even steal money from my dad's wallet just to go to the grocery store and sneak in candy and junk food. Like that was my contraband. Wow. So were your parents... Were your parents normal weight? Were your parents overweight? Was it something that, because, so tell us a little bit about that, because for a lot of people, their story starts when they're young at home and what happens in the family. So what was the relationship like with your family around food and everything? Yeah, that's a great question. My parents were both um, of average weight. Uh, we were, however, in, a, in an Air Force family. My father was an officer in the Air Force. And so there was a great emphasis on not only fitness, but also public perception. And looking back, you know, hindsight's always twenty right. twenty. I can see that, you know, my parents were embarrassed to have an overweight child, and my younger sister was not overweight. And so they actually would get very strict with me, threaten all kinds of punishment, and, you know, doing everything they could to make me lose weight. And it really had an opposite effect, and I just yeah. kept gaining weight. I wanted to be thin in my mind. It's not like I was like, yay, I'm fat. You right. know, I, I hated every minute of it. Although I played it, you know, I played the class clown. I, I did what I had to. But, um, you know, looking back, there was, like, they, the little bit of um, carbohydrate-type foods that we had in our house were kept in a locked cabinet. Like, oh that's goodness. how strict they wow. were. Wow, okay. And so I was even, you know, when I would go on these little mini binges, I would even buy ice cream. And, like, I had a whole little thing. Like, I would buy tin foil, wrap the ice cream in tin foil so I could get it into the house and that it would hopefully stay, you know, semi-frozen enough in my bedroom closet till I could eat it. I would binge until I was stuffed, and then I would actually have to somehow get the trash out of the house because if they if they found trash like candy bar wrappers, an ice cream carton, bag of chips, whatever it was, I would get in severe trouble. Wow, interesting. So it's really because food was so restricted. It was yes. almost like the forbidden fruit, so to speak, that it Absolutely. was because it was so restricted, it just made you want it more and more and more. Yeah, so it became it you know, and also too it made me sort of focus in on foods that, you know, like you and I both know that a Fuji apple can be the best tasting thing in the world. And don't get me wrong, I still love ice cream. But because I was so focused on what was termed junk food, um, I, I didn't know to even explore this healthy eating. You know, to me, it was all about the candy, all about, you know, I'm looking back now at the stuff with preservatives in it and artificial ingredients and, you know. We didn't think about any of that stuff then. No, no, we did not. Um, so, you know, but I was not mindful eating, let's just put it that way, and, and was always eating to excess. And, 
you know, again, with hindsight, I see that a lot of it also was my parents were very abusive. I write about this stuff mm-hmm. in my book, Weightless, but uh, my mother was severely abusive. And so I think a lot of times, um, aside from rebelling against my parents, that when I would eat to the point of physical pain, that then I was thinking about that and not about the circumstances of my childhood. Okay. So there was, you know, some kind of, you know, emotional abuse of some sort. Yes. And yes. so you were using the food to possibly numb those feelings and or to actually feel something. You yes, know, absolutely. Numb, numb the bad feelings and feel something else. Yes. So, yes. So, and I think you, I'm sure you come across this in your practice, but I think that when somebody starts to put on that amount of weight, there are several factors, you know, that, that need to be considered. Um, you know, there can be emotional eating, and at the mm-hmm. same time, there can be a love of junk food. You know, when we're used to those kind of flavors, our, our you know, taste buds don't ne- necessarily taste right. the worth of something super healthy, you know. I always say that, you know, when you start a healthier eating plan, that it's not going to taste as good at first. It takes a couple weeks to, you know, sort of change things over, and for our body to get used to that new stuff but then it turns out you love it you know right right your body does adjust so let me ask you going back a little bit to you know what you were saying before you know with emotional eating and you know I've heard you you know as I was reading you know through your book and you talked about being a food addict so I think people can't really discern what's food addiction what's emotional eating what's binge eating what is 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 there different categories is it all the same and in in your journey and you know what you found is is there a difference there the, i don't know that there's a huge difference and again this this is my perspective from my journey i think the one thing that always brings me back is that phrase mindful eating you know just being aware of what you're eating how it feels how your body feels after and as an overeater we uh, i we we kind of get away from that, you know, and the fact is that nine times out of 10, I don't think we're even enjoying that binge. You know, I know when I was eating, you know, I would go out for ribs and order enough for two or three. And I would even go into these restaurants and get food to go. And I would write it down, my order down on a list and pretend I was ordering for several people. Like I had my whole little thing out, even though it was all for me. So I would then go home, spread the food out, start eating, And because I knew that eventually even I would get full, you know, within 45 minutes to an hour, I would eat as much as I can. So I wasn't, you know, I'm sure there was emotional eating going on. I'm sure there was some gluttony going on. I'm sure there was a love of barbecued ribs going on. So all that stuff together. But again, the one thing that wasn't going on was the mindfulness, was the just being in touch with that situation. Um, and you know, for me, uh, you know, looking back to the abuse and also some of the bullying I received and a lot of bullying that I wasn't just in my head, right, you know, I, right. I was my own worst enemy, but, uh, I just was not in touch with, with that kind of, uh, you know, mindful eating experience. Let me ask you another question. And what you were saying, talking about binge eating, a lot of times with binge eaters, there's a little bit of self-hate going on. Do you ever recall feeling that or thinking that or, you know, you're some, sometimes, you know, we have that negative inner critic in our head that's, you know, you're this, you're that, and it's all negative. Um, was yeah. that part of your eating experience? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I was receiving these messages from my parents who, you know, thought they were doing the best for me at the time. Uh, in regards to the weight, right. um, but I was receiving these messages that, you know, I was not fitting into society, literally, um, mm-hmm. you know, they were having to order clothes for me from the Sears Big and Tall catalog, you know, so I, I was not like the other kids at my school, and so there was a lot of self-hatred going on, you know, again, with my parents, the abuse that was going on and, and the craziness of their marriage, that kind of thing, I was always so, sort of justifying it with somehow I wasn't good enough. So there absolutely was a lot of self-loathing going on. And I'm always quick to point out that I still struggle with that today. You know, it's like, oh, I get to talk to Lisa today. (laughs) What shirt's going to look good? You know, you don't look good in that color. I mean, you know, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons that that I take with me and that I talk about is is that there's no light switch. You know, it's not like we flip a switch and then it's like, yay, this is easy. I want celery. No, I want chocolate. I'm going to choose celery in this minute. I'm going to remind myself that even though my pants are a little tight, I'm still a very attractive person. 
I'm a good person on most days. And, you know, that, so that's something I always have to work on. In fact, I liken it to riding a bicycle. Like we have to keep pedaling. And right. if we stop pedaling, we're going to fall off and skin our knees right. or our egos right. or maybe gain five pounds. So we got to keep pedaling, even me. Right. So, so, so let me ask you, when you started, so I'm guessing that through six years old, through when you were in your early 20s, starting with what your parents used to do is putting you on a diet, you must have been on a, a million different diets and perhaps lost some weight, gained it back, didn't lose any weight. What, what, what happened every time you tried a new quote unquote diet? Yeah, a great. Another great question and, and very true. You know, I learned this whole on off thing and this, you know, this, this, this thing of diet, you know, that really worked against me as a kid and as somebody trying to get healthier because I really got to this thing of, okay, Monday I'm going to start and I would be great for six hours and then cheat. And then usually it'd be like, well, I'm going to start mm -hmm. again, not the next meal, not Tuesday, but the following Monday. Right. And God help us if we were past the 15th of the month, because then it was like, yeah, I'm going to start, you know. And if it was in October, November, then it's like, ah, the next year, you know. Right. So this the starting of the diet mm -hmm. became this great ritual. And usually when I would start a diet, whether it was something that maybe was a little bit more nutritionally balanced or something super crazy, like, you know, a, only a certain food group diet. I mean, I tried everything more than once. Uh, but initially, I would lose a few pounds, and it'd be very exciting. But then nine times out of ten, I wasn't either getting enough nutrients or enough balance or, you know, not kind of doing it in the right mindset. And so I would not only gain the weight back that I would lose, but I would gain more weight back. And that happened with commercial diet programs right. as well as these kind of fad diets and magazines or, you know, if I was trying diet pills, I tried everything and would always gain more weight, which, of course, led to my man boobs. Um, so it, it, the whole concept of dieting, I, I sort of, you know, hate that word. I know that when people are very overweight, sometimes they need an eating plan, mm -hmm. um, and I like that word better, you know, right. because even somebody that's thin is on an eating plan, and, you know, being in, in Los Angeles, I work with a lot of actors and actresses who, you know, they look fantastic on film, but you know what? They think about it, and, and they don't think about it in terms of a diet. They think about an eating plan because right. they know if they lose too much weight, they're going to look pasty. They maybe will not have enough energy. Um, so again, it, that concept of dieting, I think, has gotten us into a lot of trouble and leads back to what you were talking about earlier, this self-hatred. And mm -hmm. we think, my God, I can't do it. What's right. wrong with I'm me? I'm a failure. I'm a failure. I yeah. can't do it. Yeah. And, and we all know that that's one of the biggest reasons why diets don't work. Diets yes. don't work because the mentality is I'm going on something and I'm okay for as long as I could stay on it. If I just have enough willpower, I could stay on it and you know maybe finally lose this weight. But then something happens, as you just said, it's the wrong day, it's the wrong month, they ate something they didn't think they should have, and, you know, there it goes, only to start again and be angry and feel like, feel like they failed. So, yes. I mean, even with, with my clients, when I give them, you know, because everybody wants a plan, I call it a nutrition plan. I've gotten rid of the word diet plan because it's not a temporary thing. So, you know, if we want to create lifelong changes, so, you know, like of which you have Done, clearly you've created in your life so what was the turning point for you like what was there a, a rock bottom was there just something that happened where you were just like this is it I am taking hold of myself and I'm gonna start something completely different well there were, there were lots of rock bottoms in my life um, you know I remember one time in high school and I write all about this in the book they're pretty funny stories now uh -huh. but they certainly influenced where I am today I went on a date in high school with my girlfriend to the movies, and I broke the movie theater seat. And the crowded was, or the theater was crowded. The manager had to come in. I mean, it was a nightmare. But that didn't quite do it. I, I still kept gaining weight after that. I remember one time when I was in college, I went to go see a doctor, and he actually started crying because he was so concerned about my health. And oh my you know, he was saying, "You're young, and you need to." And I remember consoling him. I was patting him on the back like, it's okay, I'll lose weight. And, you know, I left there and immediately went to a fast food place. Um, but I think there were two, two big things. And one was I was watching Saturday Night Live one night and, you know, had a big bowl of ice cream and cookies in front of me. And after John Goodman was uh, giving a monologue. And, you know, here's this amazingly talented guy, but I was watching him. He was just standing there 
sweating profusely and out of breath. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm looking in a mirror because at that time of my life, I weighed over 450 pounds. And when I would talk on the phone, I would get out of breath. Like I, I couldn't wow. do anything without panting. Um, so there was that. And then I'd say the final, final straw uh, was one time I went, I was working in advertising in New York. Uh, you know, picture a 450 pound man working in the fashion industry. Uh -huh. uh, I was the original Ugly Betty. Um, and uh, I went up to a vice president who was very thin, and I saw him eating donuts, and he had a gorgeous wife and beautiful kids. And I thought, oh my God, he got some kind of newsletter that I did not get. You know, uh -huh. that he's got to have a secret. So I went in one day and I, you know, asked, earnestly asked him for some advice, and he looked at me very glibly and he said, just stop eating so much. And of course, I was very offended, you know, who's he to tell me that he doesn't know about my mom, how abusive she was, and he doesn't know that I try and diet every Monday, and, you know, all this, but the, that phrase just, just stop eating so much kept in my head. And I finally realized, you know what, that's kind of it, you know, that's, that's sort of the short and simple truth of it. And so, as you know, that's what I named my blog, right? Because uh, I believe there's got to be humor in everything. But that really was the crescendo of, uh, you know, the turning point. And by the way, Lisa, as you're learning now, I have no simple answer to a question you asked. So forgive me for, for blabbing on. Right. No, 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 no. I mean, please do. I mean, because I kind of feel that so many people who are listening could relate to you, whether it's where you are now or where you were then or someplace in between, because this is what people struggle with. I mean, people, I see it in my practice. People are on and off diets. They lose 10 pounds. They gain back 15. They, yeah. they use food for everything but hunger. You know, there's, there, you know, I'm in a good mood. I'm in a bad mood. It's just, you know, I got into a yeah. fight with my husband or my kids are driving me crazy or I finally have some peace and quiet. I'm going to sit down and eat something. And it has nothing to do with being hungry. So, yeah. you know, I think that especially for the journey that you've been on and you've lost, you know, an unbelievable amount of weight and you know I, I, I think you know a lot of people pro probably want to know what did you do how did you do it did you really focus on just the food did you focus on your behaviors I mean we know that guy said just stop eating so much and you know we kind of know it's not that cut and dry he didn't just wake up the next morning and say okay I'm just gonna not eat, <laughs> eat as much food yeah. as I've been eating if so, only it were that easy right um, so you know I think you know people want to hear what did what did you do? Because you wanted to know what he did because he was eating the donuts and he was thin. Yeah. What news yeah. What newsletter did you get? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, two, two points based on what you just said. Uh, what you're saying resonates with me so greatly. And I love talking to people like you because I learn from it. And sometimes I even learn from hearing myself talk, you know, because again, it's, it's, it's kind of, we're on the, we're always on the journey. It's not like you ever have to stop thinking right. of, you know, eating healthfully. Mm -hmm especially today where there's so many unhealthy options. But in regards to the mental side of it and that turning point, one thing I love to point out is the title of my book is Weightless, and that title has nothing to do with the pounds. It has everything to do with the mental state. Because too often today, I feel like um, that when, we, when people are trying to diet, and especially the commercial diet industry, these big corporations and stuff, right. they focus on the stomach. And really, it's about our head. Agreed. It's it's the weight loss is in our head. That's where the answers lie, and it's getting comfortable with ourselves. It's loving ourselves right now, whether we're wearing you know a size XX waist or whatever we're wearing, like in this moment, and just getting back to loving and nurturing ourselves. And so, what that meant for me, you know, back in the day, right. uh, over a decade ago now. Um, was really learning about nutrition, something I hadn't learned from all the dieting I had been on. I, I, you know, for me, good nutrition was cutting out the carbs or, you know, only a certain kind of soup every day or, you know, I didn't really understand it at all. So um, I really did research. I actually went and talked to my doctor. Um, you know, nowadays we have resources like you, which would help have helped me to shorthand this quite a bit. But um, there's so much valuable information out there, and, and there's no one plan for every person. And so really it was about educating myself, learning about the foods that would help me not only nutritionally enhance myself, but, you know, taste good, 
um, relearning portion control. That was as important as the types mm -hmm. of food I was eating because mm -hmm. I was eating gargantuan amounts of food yeah. in one in one meal. And then um, you know, so and a lot of that was relearning. Like, okay, that food did not taste very. That apple did not taste like that ice cream sundae. But I'm going to get used to it. And eventually, it tasted pretty good. And then also, even though I might have finished a meal, I'd be immediately hungry. And it became like, okay, I've got to wait 30 minutes and see how I feel in 30 minutes. And then, surprisingly enough, I felt great and not too full either, you know, which was a new sensation for me. Um, you know, we, we, we need to relearn these sensors that those of us that have a tendency towards overeating mm -hmm. have really gotten out of touch with. Right. Right. Well, we're, we're actually born with the mechanism to know when we're not, to know when we're full. So if you watch a baby eat, you know, especially when they're first starting to eat, you know, baby food, when they're full, they either turn their face or they push the spoon away. When they're done, they're done. They know I'm full. I don't need any more food in my body. And as we age or as we are conditioned by, you know, those that love, those that love us, good, bad, or indifferent, we lose that sense of what fullness feels like with just the right amount of food because we don't really need that much food to really be full. Yeah. So I, I, I have a couple friends that I, I love that analogy to, to kids and it's so true. I have a couple friends out here that will stop eating a cookie halfway through and to this day I'm like, wow, are you alien? Like what is but you know what? They know what I never learned. They could have another cookie. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're when we're again in this dieters mentality, it's sort of this last supper syndrome. Right. Exactly. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to have barbecue ribs again, or I'm never going to have ice cream again. Or even now when I eat healthy, it's like I go in and maybe order some frozen yogurt, all natural. Um, and I think, you know, I really want a large. And then I feel like, no, you know what? I'm going to get a medium and I'm going to enjoy it. And maybe next weekend I'll have it again. You know, it turns out it's not true. We can have it again. And right. same thing like after a meal, like, oh, I'm a little, I'm a little hungry still. Let me see in a half hour how I feel. You know what? In a half hour, if you're still really hungry, you could have a few right. a few raw nuts or something. Right. You know, but somehow we've gotten away from that. And so, yeah, turning to babies like that would be great, right? If you could just have a baby diet coach <laughs> with you or eating plan coach, uh, it'd be solved. Right. Well, I do. I always say to my clients, you could always eat more. You can't uneat. Oh, I like that. You can't like uneat. That. So it's just kind of it's like the same thing. Most people, if they sit for a little bit, they're going to notice I'm full. I don't need to eat more. But instinctually, when your plate is full, especially if you like something you eat, you just want more of it. And the truth is, yeah. you know, we kind of live in the land of abundance, you know, for the most part. And, you know, I live in New York City, and I'll tell my clients, go out onto the street. There's plenty there. If you want it, it's there for you. But you just want to decide, do you need it right now? Yeah. So yeah. Ha were, were there any tools or strategies or behavioral things that you did for yourself because you lost how much weight did you lose in total over 250 pounds okay, that's of excess a, weight that's a huge amount and and how long did that take you did it take you years did it take you a year no you know i found for me after years and years of trying to trick my metabolism i found that when i uh, i always call it a four prong process eat less move more drink lots of water and get lots of sleep. Like those were the four components for me. And I found that when I started to do that, like really do it, not try and fake do it for just Monday or Tuesday and then start again the following week, my body responded in kind. Like once I stopped the BS, excuse me, uh -huh. it, I lost, the weight melted away. And you know, I was younger, um, but uh, within a year's period, I had taken most of it off. Although I love to throw in there, that then I did some yo-yoing and a little bit of severe yo-yoing too. And I, you know, I chronicle that in the book. I, at one point I had gone back up almost a hundred pounds. Wow. And part of that was after I lost the weight, I thought to myself, well, don't need that thinking anymore. And, you know, wow. kind of went back to some of the unhealthy eating. And then there were some other things too. Like, you know, when I suddenly was wearing clothes that I could buy at the Gap, which was an amazing thing to go in and buy jeans there. Um, I, you know, had this new social life, but it was brand new for me. So in a way I was sort of going through a late puberty, you know, suddenly I was dating and some of the things that I had held myself back from, uh, when I was as large as I was. And it's not necessarily that I couldn't have done it then, mm -hmm. but you know, with the self persecution, I wasn't letting myself do it. 
Um, so, you know, the, all those factors went in there, and that's why, you know, I go back to the fact that we're always a work in progress. Like, to this day, I, I you know, I'm always battling five pounds, but I'd rather be thinking about that five pounds instead of the extra 250 pounds that, you know, I might be dead now or, you know, certainly would have had some to have some knee operations or, you know, be on all sorts of medication. Um, in fact, just very quickly, you'll appreciate this, Lisa. I had a physical last year and, um, you know, always evolving. And so right now I get a lot of my stuff from a farmer's market. So my good cholesterol numbers were over 100. And my doctor was floored since... Good cholesterol for men is usually somewhere 40 or over. And so he told me I was in the 100 club. And I said, as long as that's not an age, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, and I told him, I go, oh, well, you know, the farmer's market is kind of expensive. And he said, you know what, whatever it costs, it's worth it. Right. And so for somebody who used to get out of breath talking on the phone, and that was, you know, in my early 20s, um, to now being somebody that has good cholesterol over 100, feels great, actually likes the Fuji apple. And again, I still love chocolate too. Uh -huh. um, it, it, it's just, it's incredible. And we've heard this phrase a thousand times before. It's like a bumper sticker phrase, but nothing tastes as good as being thin feels. And it's so true. Like it's so freeing and so much of it is getting in touch with nutrition, healthy portions and mindful eating. Well, Talk to us a little bit about, because this is, I think this is the part that I really help my clients with, is the mindfulness. That's kind, mm. of the, that's kind of the hard part for a lot of people, because we're all on automatic pilot. We all just move through our lives. to go from one thing to the, to, uh, through to the other, especially moms that have young kids. And, yeah. you know, it's like, how did you manage to stay mindful through losing 250 pounds? And, yes, you did go back the other way, but you said that thinking went out the window. So what do you do or how do you or how I'm, I'm guessing you live your life now in a more mindful state? How did you get there? What did you do to kind of get there? Because it's an important place to be when you're making mindful choices, when you're being mindful about your hunger and your fullness. Yes, yes. I mean, mindfulness serves us across the board. And as you pointed out, we could not be further away from it from as a society. Like we get in our car and it's like, who can I call, you know, or you know, we might even be watching a really good TV show and we're checking our, you know, smartphones and, you know, all increased more if, you know, you've got kids you're taking care of or you're trying to get a spouse off to work. I mean, there's little time for ourselves. And so the last thing we're thinking about when we're fixing dinner is dinner. You know, we're thinking of a million other things. So sometimes it really, it, it, you know, we're all busy. I get that. I totally get it. But what I like to do is just take 30 seconds I'm always trying to meditate because in LA, that's what everyone does. And I'm always the one thinking, oh my gosh, when is this over? Um, but we can all take 30 seconds and, and a good time to do it is before we prepare a meal and just kind of listen for the nearest clock. If, if there's still a clock that ticks in your house and then breathe and then think about the temperature of the room and then think about, can you hear anything? Is what are your kids calling you? Can you hear your cat, your dog, whatever it is, or maybe you hear nothing. You know, maybe you hear nothing and just kind of get to that place and then, you know, consider that a restart. And so then while you're, you know, thinking about fixing lunch or dinner or breakfast, whatever it is, you know, make choices that are going to nurture you and nourish you to N words, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you want to kind of have that while you're eating as well. And, you know, a lot of times nowadays we associate that with selfishness, and I know a lot of parents have that. You know, I can't think of myself. I'm trying to think of my kids. i got to make sure my kids eat. But remember, the kids are watching you. And so if Absolutely. your kids are watching you, be mindful. If your kids are watching you enjoy your food and we're eating as a family, and, you know, we're only talking about 15 to 20 minutes, right. you know, maybe 30, um, but, you know, not in front of the TV they're then going to then start to emulate some of those behaviors. So as much as we hate it, think about, you know, trying to pass that, those healthy lessons on to your kids, especially as they reach that age where they're being influenced by commercials and stuff and are sort of starting to lose touch with that great sensor they're born with, you know? Um, and then the other thing too, my touchstone for me is how my clothes feel. That's one of the things that keeps me mindful. And I learned probably about five or six years ago that the scale was my worst enemy. If I stepped on the scale and would be up half a pound, mm -hmm. forget it. Right. it I, I, I would 
be like, Lisa, I can't do the interview. I got to cancel. I'm going to go sit in a dark room, you know? Um, and if I was under a pound, then I might have, believe it or not, a, a, a similar negative effect where I might be like, oh, I'm going to go eat this then or something. Right. And so the scale to me, I, it was a great tool while I was losing the weight, uh, but I would actually go into my doctor's office to do it. I wouldn't do daily weigh-ins at home, partially because a scale wouldn't weigh me that, that weight. Right. But that's why I love people like you that can, that can help guide us and be there and explain a weight gain or a weight loss or something, you know, to help us get to know it. But for me, it's how my clothes feel. And if I can put on, you know, my skinny jeans and buckle them without saying a Hail Mary or something, then it's a good day. And if they're a little tight, then I know I need to give a little more mindfulness to what I'm eating. So that's my touchstone. Right. So I encourage other people to find their touchstone. It might not be their skinny jeans. For them, it might be the scale. Or maybe it might be knowing that their son or daughter is watching them right. eat and learning from them. So whatever that is, make that your touchstone and hopefully a step towards getting more mindful. And also, too, as we've said a hundred times, but we can't say it enough, it doesn't necessarily get easier. I mean, it's we always have to think about it because ha, 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 our bodies, you know, even we think, oh, my gosh, I've got it all figured out. And then all of a sudden you turn a year older and your metabolism slows down a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, we're always works in progress, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually fantastic. And because of, you know, tools like this summit that you're putting online, there's all sorts of information that we can use to keep, you know, going, to keep evolving. Right, right. Well, the point of the summit is to, you know, especially speak to people like you that have gotten off of what I call the proverbial diet roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So, you know, figure out a way to eat in the life that you live, find foods that you said nourish, you know, nurture yourself more because when we love ourselves and we take care of ourselves, we feel good. So, yes. and we don't need food to try to make us feel good or get rid of those bad feelings. We just feel good. And in, actually in feeling good, I believe we feel lighter. We yes, feel lighter absolutely. in our lives and, and, and in our bodies. And, you know, speaking to what you said before, you know, in, in, in my office, the scale is optional. I mean, I'm good if somebody doesn't want to get on it. It's just, you know, go by how you feel, go by how you eat, go intuitively if Am I full? Am I hungry? You know, what am I feeling sort of thing? And, you know, it's just kind of like, and you've been off the diet roller coaster. How long have you maintained this amazing Over workout? a decade. Wow. Over a decade. Yeah, it's been a long time. And, you know, on that point that you make, which is so relevant, I, I want to encourage everyone watching or listening right now to not say, okay, well, after I lose 5, 10, 100, whatever it is, pounds, then I'm going to love myself. You will yes. find one of the biggest keys is to love yourself right now. Yes. And even if you're making healthy eating choices today, but your clothes are tight, go buy some clothes that fit. Buy a color that looks good on you. You know, again, when I'm at this weight, I got a perm. And that's how I tell myself, like, I was trying to do what I could to help my self-esteem. So, you know, you don't have to go get a perm, but get your nails done. And, and that's something a guy or girl can do. Do things that nurture yourself, that take away that nurturing from food, and really start living life as if. And when some of that thinking becomes secondary, the obsessing over, I need to be this weight to be loved, or I need to be this weight for somebody to find me attractive, or find yourself attractive in this minute, and your body will respond. I mean, you think about it. When we have a friend in need, and we love them, we want to help them. When we have somebody that we don't necessarily care for or somebody that maybe has been mean to us in need, we don't want to help them. Well, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, we think of ourselves as the enemy. There's something wrong with right. me. I'm eating too much. I'm doing this wrong. I'm too fat. I'm too ugly. I'm, you know, this, again, that voice in our head. And we need to shift that voice to, you know what? You walked out the door today. No matter what weight you are, you walked out the door. The sun shone down on you. And... You know, maybe you have kids that look up to you or a little puppy or whatever it is. Yeah. There are people in your life that love you, and we need to see ourselves through those eyes. And along with the, the nourishment from real and healthy, clean foods, that kind of mental nourishment is going to be so key to accomplishing anything. But let it start right now. Don't put it off. Love yourself. Love yourself. You're so worth it. Right. Well, that is a amazing and wonderful and right on message 
to wrap this up on. And I know that you have, for our listeners, a special gift. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I do. It's a lifetime supply of chocolate. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I have a uh, ebook that's called Just Stop Mindless Eating. And it's, you know, sort of a riff on the Just Stop Eating So Much theme. And basically what it is, is a PDF that you can download that talks about some of what Lisa and I talked about earlier in terms of getting more mindful in the moment, being in the moment, and kind of reassessing how we look at our lives. And, you know, it's again, it's, it's not so much about dieting or doing something totally different. It's just sort of taking a different perspective on things and also really loving and nourishing yourself in the moment. A lot of the things, again, that we've talked about. And there's also um, some worksheets in this uh, ebook that you can fill out before a meal, after a meal, before bed, first thing in the morning, that can then hopefully help you get a little bit more in touch with how you're thinking. And it really only takes a minute or two to fill these out. And um, there's a link in the book that can tell you where you can even get, you know, you can download the more worksheets for free. But again, it just helps us all be that work in progress that we are. Okay. Well, that's great. I bet everybody's going to the link right now and they're downloading it because they can't wait to get started. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, Greg, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I think it was really important for people to hear to know that, you know, whether they're, you know, sitting where you were or sitting where you are or someplace in between, I think that they're going to be able to get a lot out of it and, you know, use some of the stuff that we've discussed to start making the changes to just get them to a happier, healthier self. That's awesome. And I thank you for inviting me to be part of this and for all you're doing to help so many people. I, I really, I sincerely, we need more Lisa's okay. in this world. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. And thank you for your time. And it was great, great to have you here. Thanks. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.